Okay, how's everybody doing today? All right, look, I just want to introduce myself. My name is uh, Cedric Wenz. I'm the commanding general of what used to be formerly called the U.S. Army's Research Development Engineering Command. Uh, it is now CCDC, or Combat Capabilities Development Command. And today, we want to talk to you a little bit about one of the modernization areas, one of the key modernization areas for the Army that's socially valid. Um, I've got with me today Mr. Doug Tamilio, who is the Soldier Center Director under CCDC. Uh, and so Doug and his team lead the Army's efforts from an s &T perspective on everything that deals with soldier lethality. So his partnership with Brigadier General Dave Hodney, uh, the CFT lead to get after the Army's modernization priority of soldier lethality uh, falls on Doug and his team's lap. In addition, the synthetic training environment uh, under Major General Maria Gervais is the other area that falls within uh, Doug's basket of technology development, technology characterization, partnerships with industry to bring about a better capability for the Army. And so today, uh, we're not going to talk about, and I'm not going to talk about uh, all of the eight modernization priorities. We're going to focus exclusively on one. And this is, this is an important one. Uh, as many of you all have heard uh, in a number of different public statements and testimonies, the Chief Staff of the Army has put a premium on uh, getting after capability and technology uh, that increases the lethality and the performance of uh, the U.S. Army soldiers and our joint partners. Um, and so that's a key area for us. It's also a key area because, uh, as was mentioned this morning, um, some of the findings coming out of the Close Combat uh, Tactical Task Force, uh, some of the studies that have, have gone on, uh, we're talking about getting measurable increases in capability uh, for the soldier. Uh, and so, Doug's going to talk a little bit about some of the capability that his team is working on, uh, which comes in successive spirals in a number of different areas. Uh, enhanced MVGs, uh, the IVAS technology, and the like. And he's going to use the training aid. Uh, this big fellow right here kind of looks like me. All right, so I tried to tell Doug to make sure uh, he wasn't going to take it off of him as a model. Right? He wanted somebody in the 95th percentile. Okay, so that's me. Uh, and so Doug is going to talk to you a little bit, a little bit about that uh, and where we are going. And where we are going is, uh, from an s and perspective, uh, we are the organization uh, that drives the execution of the work that's being done in support of uh, the modernization priorities and the focus that's been given to them has been led by uh, the cross-functional team leads. And so that's very important to understand. Each one of the directors that are part of uh, CCDC has been charged with the responsibility of leading and overseeing from an s and perspective and partnering very closely with each and every one of the CFTs. Uh, and that's the only way that we're going to be able to deliver on the technology that's going to provide enhanced capability to the warfighter. Uh, and that's what we're focused on, and that's what we're committed to doing. Uh, the the Undersecretary of the Army talked about the move arounds that we did uh, to realign uh, well over a billion dollars in effort. Uh, a lot of that will start to show itself uh, in the current budget that's on the Hill. Uh, and so it's very important uh, that we realign resources so we put our money where our mouth is, so to speak, to make sure that we're getting after that capability. So I'm going to turn it over to Doug. He's going to talk specifically about social lethality uh, and what we're doing to enhance the capabilities of the warfighters. All right. Can you turn my mic on? Thanks, sir. You got? Can you hear me? No. I got two mics and neither one's working. Can you hear me now? Anybody? Anybody hear me? Can you hear me? No, you can't hear me, can you? Can you hear me? I'll just use this one. Or I won't. Can you hear me? I'm. You can't hear me now. 
use this one. Awesome. So I got three mics now. So General Wins was, uh, if, you, if you really want to know the story, right? So he tasked me to develop the training aid because he said, one, I can't talk in front of a crowd without one. Two, it was going to be my, uh, my face up there. And when he saw it, he absolutely said, absolutely, that's not going to happen. Uh, and so then he said, I must have notes to talk to you because I forget a lot. Age is a terrible thing. Hey, uh, today I'm going to talk about uh, s and the general already mentioned, that supports two CFTs, social lethality, uh, General Dave Hodney in the back, if you raise your hand, uh, my uh, team partner back there, and uh, General Jave, I don't think she's here now, but she was here earlier. And so she's in charge of the STI uh, CFT. And so we're going to talk about capabilities that the entire team is bringing to bear uh, across souls of lethality. And when I mention souls of lethality, STI, in my opinion, falls under there, and I'll talk about that in a minute. But what we're trying to do here is, with, across this portfolio, is reduce the burden on our soldiers. Everybody knows our soldiers are overweight, overburdened with weight. Uh, we're trying to increase their performance and increase the lethality of both squads, uh, individual soldiers and squads. So again, a disclaimer up front, I'm the S&T uh, part of this equation, right? I don't come up with the requirements, that's General Hardney and, that, and uh, General Gervais, and I don't, put, I don't field equipment, that's General Potts and other PEOs that I partner with. And so some of the efforts you're gonna see today are purely S&T, some are a mix, and some are PEO efforts, but they're all under AFC's purview of the Future Force Modernization Enterprise, okay? Uh, I'd like to thank um, Frank Blackwell, if he's here, uh, because this training, he's not here, is he? But the training aid that they gave me was done by Aviation and Missiles Command S3I Directorate, and they turned that around in a very quick time, and I think when you see it, you're gonna appreciate it, because it really tells the story better than I can. Um, General mentioned that all of our uh, efforts are aligned to capability gaps and the requirements set forth by General Gervais and General Hardney, as well as Don Sando over MCOE. Um, and finally, I just want to remind everybody, when we started this endeavor a few years ago, when the Chief laid out his modernization priorities, under soldier lethality, he specifically mentioned next generation squad weapon, exoskeletons, he said body armor, and we, I interpreted that as protection right, environmental, eye, hearing, all the other types of protection that we need for our soldiers, human performance, sensors, training, STI, and radio. We don't really deal with the radio. The two, uh, two individuals, General Gallagher and uh, General um, Bassett up here, that's who in there, Bailiwig is part of the network, okay? All right, so we're gonna try this training aid. Let's see if it works. Right, give it a second, it's gonna take. So that just shows you everything that's gonna be on a soldier in the next, uh, in the, within the fight up. Uh, and what we're gonna start with is the, um, this improved combat helmet. So this is an s and effort that is transitioned already over to the PEO. But this helmet using uh, lightweight polyethylene material and the processes developed at Natick uh, Laboratories allows us to uh, form a helmet that's gonna provide a 40% reduction in weight uh, against a P-level threat. That is significant. The PEO has already taken that material in their programmer record, which is the uh, IHIPS, and they've got prototypes that they're starting to take through testing, right? So a little bit more time as we get through testing, but that'll be a fielded uh, capability. That's significant. Um, that, what you see there, is not the actual design. It has cutouts in the ears. The actual uh, will be more of an ECH-style uh, ECH, uh, device. Okay, the next development item here is... Uh, the Advanced Night Vision Goggle Binocular. So this really isn't a current s and program. Colonel Chris Snyder and the PEO a soldier is, is running this. But a lot of the technology here started in the labs and centers and CCDC over the last years. Again, championed by Soldier Lethality CFT, enabled by PMSSL. But this blends uh, night, Im excuse me, image intensifiers and long range infrared for uh, night, smoke, dust, and it will allow for ap uh, rapid target acquisition. So the actual sight of the weapon will be, will be seen through the uh, goggles. Hey, Lord. And so you'll be able to take that device. As a matter of fact, uh, Soldier Touchpoint, uh, well, I'm getting ahead of myself. I'll talk to the next one, IVAS, excuse me. So the next one is the uh, integrated visual augmentation system. So this really takes EVGMBs to the next level. All right, uh, STP-1, uh, Soldier Touchpoint-1 is ongoing at Fort Pickett. 
and I'm hearing great uh, reports from that event. I'm going to go out there on uh, this Thursday and see it. But again, another effort championed by Soldier Lethality, uh, pushed to the forefront, executed by Colonel Chris Snyder at PEO Soldier. So this really brings to our formations, and General Gervais mentioned it earlier, the first time that soldiers are going to be able to train with a system that they can take to combat. It's an integrated uh, uh, capability set. So again, it has day-night capability, heads-up display. It's going to combine IR squared and thermal. It's going to have the ability to train and fight with one system. And it puts the weapon sight, navigation, and any other icons you want to put in that uh, up front for the soldier. Uh, it allows training that can't be done today. That's significant. So this next effort really takes it to the next level. And this is a congressionally funded effort. Congress funded us a few million dollars last year to get at this. And what they're looking at is we have this disparate systems. Now can we integrate them into a form fit helmet that does everything we needed to do in terms of uh, open systems architecture so we can add and subtract from it, a face shield display so it won't look exactly like that. Uh, it's going to have power and power management built into the helmet. Uh, integrate digital and voice communication, provide uh, overpressure, and continue to reduce the size and uh, weight and center of gravity of that helmet system. Uh, and then advanced digital sensors as they develop can be inputted to the system. I think everybody's familiar with this next one, the next generation rifle. So this is an s and project designed to develop both the next generation squad weapon to replace the 249 uh, saw in squads, as well as the M4 carbine uh, eventually. The, uh, it will have a, a family of ammunition. I mean, only what's shown up there is the uh, is, uh, case telescopic, but uh, it will have everything from training to tracer uh, to reduce range. Uh, it's optimized for weight, size, and lethality. It's being developed using lightweight materials, new barrel manufacturing processes, include a muzzle uh, device. It will even have an electromechanical trigger and intelligent rails, and the next slide will tell you why we need that. So along with that, ammunition and weapon is the next generation optics. So really this is fire control. Um, if you think about the ability of a soldier to get a first round on target, it's critical. And this device coupled with that weapon system will allow them to do that. So again, day night, it'll have uh, all those capabilities. We're looking for a TRL level six optic uh, with a digital camera, advanced target recognition and tracking algorithms. So we're looking at a significant increase in the probability of a first round hit, and that's done by some different ways. But one, uh, if everybody was familiar with the old XM25 and the capability to laze and then get an augmented, uh, adjusted aim point, that with the electro, uh, electromagnetic uh, trigger will help do that. I gotta speed up, I'm being told I'm going too slow, sorry. Alternative energy technologies, look, we're looking at two different types of technologies right now, lithium ion, is not going to get the power density we need to supply all of these advances that we're trying to uh, put on soldiers. So silicon anode is a technology we're looking at hard. As a matter of fact, we Good believe... Ladies and gentlemen, the next presentation in... <laughs> I must be really over time. <laughs> Where's Dave Bassett? He owes me now. All right, I'll go faster. Anyways... <laughs> So I'll go pretty quick, but this technology is going to increase the density by 100% or reduce the weight by 50%. This is significant. We are going to have prototypes of this delivered for Soldier Touchpoint uh, 3 and 4 for IVAS. All right? They won't be ready to be fielded systems, but they will allow that system to operate the way it needs to. So I'm going to go quicker. I apologize. Lightweight torso protection. So we've been mandated by Congress to achieve a 20% reduction in the weight of body armor. We are going to achieve that with lighter materials, but also we're looking at a shooter's cut to give the soldier more flexibility uh, while he's using his weapon. That has not been decided yet. Uh, that's a way above my pay grade, uh, but it's probably at the vice chief of staff of the Army level, but that's starting to be elevated up to that to get those decisions. Uh, the reserve automatic activation device for T-11, I mean, in basic sense, this device is going to reduce the fatalities of our jumpers. This device will automatically activate a reserve parachute if a soldier cannot do it. Uh, it also is smart enough to know when it shouldn't activate. 
this is going through uh, maturation testing now, and it's very promising technology. Can I go to the next one? Is that our physical augmentation? Thanks. So really, exoskeletons is what we're talking about. For the first time, we're seeing, uh, seeing uh, exoskeletons that are reducing the soldier burden. Uh, we're able to use what we've got today provided by two industry partners, a third coming on very shortly, uh, with touch points at uh, Fort Drum uh, to get at what, what we're trying to figure out is what exoskeletons do we need for specific MOSs and specific tasks. And we're working through that. Very promising technology. It's the first time in probably 10 or 15 years that exoskeletons are really uh, reducing the burden. Uh, close combat assault ration. Look, I love to eat. I may not look like it, but I do. But uh, a squad today for seven days needs seven, uh, 283 pounds of MREs. 283 pounds to, for a squad for seven days. This is called the combat assault ration. This is technology using vacuum microwave developed in Canada and given to us down at Natick. There's only a few of these around the, uh, the, the systems, but this is the equivalent of three MREs. We plan to have this probably fielded out through DLA in the next three to four years. This is pretty significant. If you think about not just for a squad or, or um, a soldier or a squad, but for our entire uh, infrastructure that we have to keep the supply of MREs on hand. We've reduced the cube by 42% and the weight by 39% and the cost by 35%, it's pretty significant. I'm not gonna pass it out because it's not ready to eat yet. And someone will do that. Uh, the next one is, um, this is Squad uh, Operations Advanced Resupply. So we're talking about is precision aerial supply in complex terrain. For anybody that knows, uh, if you're looking at a mega city, it's very difficult to drop a parachute with any accuracy. And we've gotta be able to do that in GPS denied environment. And we're looking at 50 to 500 pound capability that we've already successfully tested. And so this is very close to being uh, the ability to be fielded here. So dismount robotics, autonomous systems. This is the soldier born system. Everybody's probably familiar with them. PEO soldiers are gonna start fielding that. That was an s and effort led by uh, Natick. The key behind the next part of this effort though is to make sure that these systems can work in a GPS divine environment and they're not soldier intensive. So we don't want soldiers to have to fly this or multiple UAVs. We want them to just go out autonomously, and that's the next effort. Okay, Net, Net Warrior upgrades. Uh, the Soldier Center works with PEO Soldier to provide upgrades to Net Warrior across a multitude of things. Uh, some of the things we've done recently is um, the um, uh, ATAC system and, and other things, but it, uh, they, they would not probably survive, and Bill Bauer was here earlier if it wasn't for the software that we're developing for them. Next slide. Okay. So, not the most sexy item, but boots is, in, they are, if you have to wear, if you carry 120 pounds for a long time, boots is incredibly important, right? Right, sir? And so, we, we've undertaken an effort. Right now, soldiers leaving basic training in OSIT get fielded basic combat boots. They're not taking them to their next units. They're not wearing them. If you look at any soldier out here right now, they're not wearing the combat boots that the Army provides. So, we gotta change that. Success of this program will be when a soldier leaves OSIT, and goes to his next unit, the boots he's wearing is the boots that he wants to wear. And so we've got 1,600 prototypes from three different industry partners out in the field right now going through testing. By June of this year, we will have a performance spec that we turn over to PEO Soldier to be able to provide soldiers with a more comfortable, lighter weight, and uh, boots that don't even require wear uh, breaking. It's pretty significant. And I think the last one is, so I, I talked about uh, IVAS earlier and the ability of IVAS to look at uh, the, uh, you know, to have sensors on a soldier and IVAS to be able to tell the, the physiological status monitoring of that. This is what this program is. This is purely an ST effort to figure out what sensors do we need to put on the soldier, what kind of data do we need to collect from them, where do we store that data, what the algorithms are to process that data to ultimately feed into NetWarrior so we can get the status. And I mentioned the integrated helmet, sensors in that helmet, sensors on the weapon, all of that will feed into the system. It's pretty significant. So I went way over time. So I'm gonna say that uh, I won't open to questions, but if you have questions for either myself or General Wins, uh, we're gonna be here for, uh, for a little bit. Is that okay? All right, well thank you very much, appreciate it. I don't know how to take all this off. Christina Corbett. All right, hey Christina, hi.